Hello everybody. Hello YouTube. Hello art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with yet another video. Um, and this time, it's going to be a dilly. <laughs> I've come back after a two week, approximately two week absence. I've been busy, busy up the wazoo. And I said that I would be busy and I have been busy. And now what I've been busy with is basically over. Um, now I just have to wait and hope for the best. I've done everything that I can do. It's out of my hands now. So I'm just hoping, you know, that, that everything turns out the way I want it to turn out. So, you all, I, I, I'm, you know, I've, I've been in what, like I said, for two, two weeks, I've been a dry dock. Um, and I'm back with yet once again yet another video this is another shining related video so I guess officially this is a rum break um, and y'all I I'm tired but still happy and optimistic and I, f I just felt like doing a video I felt like doing a talk video um, and since it's shining related we're I'm just gonna go ahead and call it a rum break uh, y'all at this point, I'll just go ahead and, and do my church announcements and get right into what I want to do. Um, don't want to waste too much of your time because I've got a lot of reading to do for you. Um, so, you know, let me just get, get into it. Uh, returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. And each and every one of you, I'm, I'm extremely appreciative that you're here, all 494 of you. Um, I don't know if, if I can convey uh, how appreciative I am, how much it means to me that anybody, I mean anybody, wants to listen to anything I have to say about any of this, any of my long-ass videos and my ramblings and my rants and so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to try and get back into a schedule of doing my understanding videos and my Twin Peaks videos and so on and so forth. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of finding the time and the energy. But once again, thank you all. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share the video if you know anybody who might be interested in this nonsense. Um, and at this point, you know, go ahead and get yourself something to drink, maybe a snack, find a comfortable place to sit because it's going to be another long one. That's what I do. I make long videos. Um, or if you're you're doing chores or working out or whatever, you know, maybe this is the perfect video to help pass the time while you're doing those things or help, you know, keep your mind off of the drudgery while you're doing those things. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to get into it. Y'all, like I said, I've been in dry dock for about two weeks. I'm back with with this one. And I wanted to talk about this today. Um, because it intrigues me. There is a video and an uh, accompanying Twitter thread that has been making the rounds lately, and I'm intrigued by it. That's why I'm doing this video. Um, this is one article, and there's a lot of articles regarding this video and or Twitter thread. Uh, this this uh, article here from Open Culture, it says a Kubrick scholar uh, discovers an eerie detail in The Shining that's gone, gone unnoticed for more than 40 years. Okay, um, it says, you know, go ahead and watch this video. It's a good video, and it's a good Twitter thread, too. There's the link to it here, uh, and I'm, I'm going to link to this. Anything I, you see here in this video today, um, I'm going to link to it, and then you get to go read it and look at it on your own, in your own time. But this, uh, again, this video and this thread, interesting. Uh, it's, I'll just read this short article. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's The Shining pulls off the uncommon feat of inhabiting uh, a genre without falling victim to its vices. But exactly which genre does it inhabit? Horror, meta-horror, supernatural thriller, psychological drama. Most of the pictures made for these broad fields of cinema share a dispiriting lack of rewatchability, especially those reliant on the device of the twist ending. M. Night Shyamalan's 
uh, The Sixth Sense, for example, which now, 24 years after its release, is enjoyed primarily as an artifact of its cultural era. But over the past four decades, The Shining has only become a richer viewing experience and one that continues to yield heretofore unseen details. In the new video above and an associated Twitter thread, Kubrick scholar Filippo Olivieri exposes one such detail, or rather a whole series of them, throughout his performance as the Overlook Hotel's increasingly troubled caretaker Jack Torrance, Jack Nicholson, keeps looking directly at the camera. I'm not talking about when he looks at the camera because he's talking to someone else, says Olivieri. I'm talking about all the times in which Jack Torrance looks at the camera, but there's no one to look at. All are very brief moments captured by a few frames of film, or even just one. But given how many times it happens, much more than the one fourth wall breaking glance already, already acknowledged by sh shining ex exegetes, uh, as well as Kubrick's well-known perfectionist attention to detail, all this can hardly be an accident. Despite the existence of documentary footage that shows Kubrick explicitly telling Nicholson to look down at the camera in one shot, this choice has remained, as it were, overlooked. But what to make of it? It could mean that we are not safe from Jack's fury. He knows where we are. He may come for us next. And that's in quotes. Uh, yet, he also looks at the camera well before, descending into insanity. Who is looking at Jack? Ghosts? The ghosts of the Overlook Hotel? Perhaps Jack felt their presence from the very beginning, so the camera in The Shining must be, well, a ghost itself. But if the subjective camera represents the ghostly point of view, uh, does that mean that I am a ghost too? And more importantly for fans, does that mean Kubrick outdid uh, Shalaman, nearly 20 years before The Sixth Sense came out. All interesting questions. Um, I personally, I'm just going to go ahead and let you know right away how I feel about this and what I think. I don't agree with it. I don't agree that the audience is the, is the ghost. I don't believe that the camera is the ghost. Uh, with, you know, the Jack Nicholson playing Jack Torrance, uh, looking straight at the camera or viewer as it were i don't believe it's been i don't believe it's menacing i don't believe it's what does it say here um what oh something about fury uh why can't i find it uh oh yes the, the, it could mean that we are what no it could mean that we are not safe from jack's fury no uh he knows where we are. He may come for us next. No, I don't think that's what it means. E period. I mean, this, you know, this, this observation that he looks at the camera or at the viewer, so to speak, is an extremely interesting observation. And I think Olivieri is awesome for noticing that. Um, because some of the things in this movie are very difficult to notice. But the interpretation is what I don't agree with, even though it's an interesting interpretation. Um, I'll talk about what I think in another video about that. Today I'm just covering, um, you know, this guy, Olivieri, and his work, uh, which is intriguing work, I've got to say. Um, this another article about this very same video and or Twitter thread. And this thing is making the rounds, y'all. It just popped up. Oh, golly. Uh, a couple of days ago, and it's already all over the place. I don't know how it got all over the place that quickly, but it did. Um, and, I'm, you know, if if you want to, uh, I'll, I'll probably, like, discuss this with you, Tankard, in the DMs um, on Twitter. I have my, I have, I have several ideas regarding this whole thing, but it's going to take me a little time to like think about it. That's why I got to read through this stuff first. Uh, and I haven't read any of this stuff yet that I'm going to, um, that I'm about to read to you. I'm going to read it raw. Uh, and uh, you know, you're going to get my immediate, like visceral reaction to it right away. Okay. Uh, here's the second article, Screen Rant, uh, shocking 
the shining theory turns you into an overlook hotel ghost again i don't agree with that at this point no i don't believe there are any ghosts at the hotel period that's why i can't agree with that because i've at, at least as, as far as things are concerned at this point in time i have made my decision there are no ghosts at the overlook hotel this is all psychological projections of the of the, of the various characters in the movie mostly jack and wendy um mostly jack or jack or let me rephrase that mostly wendy and or jack possibly danny but that one that that pos that possibility is a little bit difficult um you know for various reasons that's how i feel no ghosts it's all psychology and it's all an exploration of uh, the human. In my opinion, The Shining is an exploration of the human unconscious mind uh, in the context of uh, the effects that history and culture and mythology and just, you know, whatever we call civilization, the effects of those things on the human mind and how we all seem to have the same set of kind of archetypes that we deal with mentally. And also, I believe that Kubrick is trying to save the world. Okay, and I, oh, again, I'll get into that in another video, but that's that's why I don't believe the ghost thing. That's why I said that. Um, this article, oh, a little bit longer, so I don't know if I'll have time to read all of this. Um, and what, again, Olivieri's work seems very good, but what it bothers me is that this is being taken as an ultimate cut by the authors of these magazines or whatever it's being just accepted as like an ultimate conclusion and that because you know somebody noticed a, a very rightfully and very very uh impressively noticed this detail in this movie and then cup come they came up with an uh, a theory about it and I don't, I don't think that even Olivieri is, if I'm not mistaken, if I please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that even Olivieri is 100% set with regard to, you know, Jack looking at us makes us the ghost theory. I don't think he's 100% totally set regarding that, but they're making it sound like he is, and they're making it sound like that, you know, the audience says the ghost theory is just it. And there's no more discussion. No, 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 no. There's plenty more to discuss, um, especially if you don't believe that there's ghosts in the movie. And it, oof, that's my only issue with this. So um, maybe I'll just read this last part of this article, how the audience ghost theory changes the shining Olivieri's theory adds another layer to the story of the shining as it makes jack a more sympathetic figure than before famously king's main problem with the shining adaptation in the novel you know you know i don't care about the novel however the shining's ending makes more sense if viewed through the lens of Olivieri's theory and this makes jack's character arc less harsh how? Throughout the entire movie, Jack constantly checks on the camera. He is aware of the ghosts following him around, and more. And the more unhinged he becomes, the more angry and upset he seems to be by the camera's presence. Ooh, shit. Hold on. Okay, let me keep going. In early scenes, Jack smiles when glancing at the camera, but becomes increasingly distraught by its presence in later screenshots. In a much subtler way, Kubrick's movie shows that Jack is trying to resist the influence of the Overlook every time he looks at the camera and flinches, feeling its watchful gaze. While he doesn't end up redeemed in The Shining, Jack does end up feeling more human in this reading. No. Okay, now... I'll go ahead and tell you how I really feel. <laughs> um, I don't believe that there are ghosts in the hotel. I don't believe the camera or the viewer is a ghost or is converted into a ghost by this, this observation by Olivieri that Jack uh, Torrance looks at the camera many times in the movie. Um, 
I, because I, again, I don't believe that there are ghosts in the hotel in any way or in the movie in any way, shape or form. So how can that make the audience a ghost? I think that the Jack care, but this, this is important. Olivieri's observation is incredibly important because it puts a very particular kind of focus on the Jack Torrance character. Uh, and that's J uh, Jack Torrance's, as Olivieri rightly, rightly states, his awareness of the camera, his awareness of being watched, seemingly, if he confronts the camera or he acknowledges the camera's presence by looking directly at it. I don't believe the camera's presence is the audience. I believe it's Stanley. Our Stanley. When the Jack character, and not Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson is the actor doing an amazing job, as he always does. But the Jack Torrance character is is the one that Stanley is focusing on. And if I'm right about any of the uh, any of the things I've said in my many, many, many videos about this movie, and yeah, I've been playing with the um, thumbnails of my of my uh, videos. But if I'm right about you know, the, in part, partially, that The Shining is Stanley Kubrick's criticism, very intense and and sharp criticism of Stephen King and his writing and his career as an author. And if, you know, if I'm right, and I think that Stanley Kubrick just didn't like Stephen King, he just didn't like him at all. Um, and he, I think that Jack, um, not Jack, oh no, um, Stanley, just real. in my opinion, I, I, I have nothing to go by other than my observations too, just like Olivieri here. Um, but I believe that if and when, um, Stanley Kubrick met Stephen King, I think that... Stanley Kubrick did not like Stephen King and whatever it is that Stephen King represented to him to Stanley Kubrick and I believe that in uh, the, the Shining is dealing with mythology and and the what we call the civilized world and that I believe that Stanley in with the Shining and all of his movies really is trying to save the world but I also think that he is spending Stanley Kubrick spent uh, a good amount of time and good amount of effort in The Shining, tearing Stephen King to shreds because he might very well have detested Stephen King as a person. And and that's what, the, like I said, that's where the blood comes from, the elevator. That's from Carrie. That's from the pig's blood in Carrie. All that snow, the freak snowstorm in The Shining, that's Stephen King's cocaine. Um, the typewriter and, the, you know, the Jack Torrance character is Stanley's representation of Stephen King as basically just a piece of shit human being. Because the Jack Torrance character, Stephen King, Stephen King himself, I think, said that after years and years and years after writing The Shining, he finally realized that he was modeling the Jack or in the in the book, The John uh, Edward Daniel Torrance character after himself, after years, I mean years after writing it, he finally realized he was writing about himself. Um, okay. I, I think Stanley Kubrick realized that right away. Okay. Diane Johnson is not going to tell us everything. Okay. She's going to, she's, she's keeping Stanley's secrets. I, if, if maybe Stanley didn't even tell Diane and, you know, he, he told us though, he, if, the, if there's one thing that the audience is, the viewer is for the, the shining, the movie, we are Stanley's witnesses. And those of us who have eyes, eyes to see, we are witnessing again, his commentary on mythology and the source of evil in the world and, and what have you, and his effort to save the world. But we're also witness to him basically using maybe even the Stephen King slash Jack Torrance uh, character as an example of everything that's wrong with this world. 
And one of the things that's very seriously wrong with this world is nepo babies, nepotism, people who have no business being in the positions that they are, and they're promoted to those positions. They have no talent. They have no education. They have no... They're just not supposed to be where they are based on merit or 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 talent or or even hard work or anything like that and stephen king is one of those people his career makes absolutely no sense his books are horrible okay that's my opinion if you don't agree with me that's fine but you know i'm the one making this video um terrible writer and seem seems like a pretty terrible person too in many ways and i once again I believe that Stanley Kubrick saw right through him and right through his ridiculous book, and maybe that's why he wanted to use it f to do whatever he was trying to do with The Shining. Okay? Um, and so the Jack Torrance focusing on the uh, camera thing is he's, you know, Jack Torrance gets madder and madder and madder at the camera throughout the movie because Stephen King's character is getting madder and madder and madder about being exposed by Stanley Kubrick. And we see that to this day. Every time every time Stephen King has the opportunity, he talks shit about the movie, The Shining. He talks shit about Stanley Kubrick. And it makes no sense. He should be grateful. He should be appreciative to Stanley Kubrick and whoever else contributed to the creation of The Shining for elevating his awful book you know but anyway so i said what i said regarding that and if you want to know more about how i feel and my other observations and whatever like i said subscribe to my channel and watch all all every single last one of my videos about the shining i think you'll get a kick out of it if you're a shining fanatic if if you're a shining fiend like i am and so many of the people are especially my regular commenters you know, hey Gershom, uh, hey Rich and Law, hey Tankard, hey Exorcist Reviews, hey Boxy, how you doing? Um, <laughs> and I hope I didn't forget any. Oh, Anno Domini, you too. Um, you guys, thank you so much for coming back again and again. But um, I, you know, and I, I might sound like I'm being unnecessarily critical of Ulivieri's theory. I, I'm not. I agree with Ulivieri, uh, maybe halfway. And the other half, I have my own ideas. So, no disrespect. Uh, this is not meant to um, poo-poo uh, Mr. Olivieri's ideas or his work. But I have my own ideas, and I think my ideas are valid as well. Now, I do like Olivieri, and I do like his eye. I do like his powers of perception and, and observation. Um, and I dug around a little bit and I said I'm going to be doing a lot of reading. Now, I don't know if I've, <clears throat> I don't know if I've featured this article in any one of my prior videos. If I have, okay, but it's from 2020 and this is by, um, uh, Filippo Olivieri. Uh, it is called, uh, King versus Kubrick, the origins of evil. Now, I hope I haven't read this already. If I have, I apologize. But in light of these, uh, you know, this, this video and article making the rounds, if I, even if I already have read this or parts of this, it bears repeating. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this article or this m more or less a paper. This, this, uh, by Mr. Olivieri about the, uh, um, he, obviously, he mentions Stephen King here, okay? And I, I, I'll read the intro, then I'll go take a little coffee break, and I'll come back, okay? So, this is by Olivieri, S.K. versus S.K., King versus Kubrick, The Origins of Evil. Um, I'll read the first paragraph. Uh, it is a common trope that authors rarely like films based on their novels. Stephen King, who at the time of this writing has seen... 48 feature films and 26 television series adapted from his works is no exception. In the past, he expressed reservations about several films. There are some that leave me cold, like Christine, uh, is a quote from King, uh, he said once. And there are some that I actively dislike, uh, like Firestarter, Children of the Corn, and The Shining. Okay. Uh, no, uh, no other 
film has provoked King's ire as much as Stanley Kubrick's version of The Shining. Unremitting in his condemnation, King has criticized every element in the film, from the casting of the two leading actors to Kubrick's direction. In what is perhaps his most famous quote, King likened the film to a great, big, beautiful Cadillac with no motor inside. You can sit in it and, in, and you can enjoy the smell of the leather upholstery. The only thing you can't do is drive it anywhere. That is the dumbest analogy I've ever heard in my life. Uh, Stephen, uh, now, this is coming from allegedly a good author. Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, King's dislike of Kubrick's film is so renowned that it is indeed surprising to find that this initial reaction to the to the film seemed favorable. Or when he saw The Shining in a private screening two days before the film's release, Warner Brothers executives noted in an internal memo that King loved it. Oh dear. Um, a reaction that appeared to be genuine and that was even confirmed by his agent. Quote, Stephen King truly had a positive reaction, considering, considered the film faithful to book, and in any interview will say good things to promote the film. Um, that doesn't sound right to me. That doesn't sound like it really happened. He started talking shit back in, what, 1978 before the movie was released, while it was still filming. But, you know, this is a Warner Brothers, I guess, notes or memos or whatever. Uh, Stephen King betrayed his employers. Looks like it anyway. So that's the first little part of this article. As you can see, there's lots to read, and I will get through it. We will get through it. Well, not, maybe not that much, but we will get through it. Um, and I can't wait to read the rest of this. I can't wait to read what Olivieri has to say about the animosity that King has towards uh, Kubrick. And just the picture that he chose of Stephen King for the beginning of this article, this is not a good picture. Uh, this tells me that Olivieri is maybe cr just, uh, maybe not as critical of Stephen King as I am, but, you know, <laughs> look at this picture. <laughs> I think maybe Olivieri is, is uh, at, at least in, in some part, uh, critical of, of Stephen King. What well, we, we will see after our, I'm done reading this article. We will see. So now it's coffee break time. I will be right back. Hold on. All right, I'm back. Um, so here's now the point of the video where you need to get comfortable, really comfortable. Um, like I said, I like Olivieri's work, but I don't, I only agree with the, um, Jack looking at the camera theory to an extent. Yes, I believe it's a very good observation, but I'm not sold on the idea that it represents ghosts or Jack being aware of the ghost or we, us, the audience, the viewer, we're the ghost. No, I think Stanley Kubrick is who the Jack Torrance um, slash Stephen King character is looking at. And that's why he gets angrier and angrier. He doesn't like being scrutinized and exposed by Stanley Kubrick. And if anybody, if no, if the camera represents anybody, it's Stanley Kubrick. Stanley Kubrick's very critical eye and very, you know, very critical opinion of Stephen King. And I think I've talked about that already, poss possibly, that, you know, in the scene in The Shining where Jack Torrance is in the Colorado lounge bouncing the tennis ball off of the wall above the fireplace, and we see the beige, the typewriter, um, and the cigarette. I think that is a representation of Stanley Kubrick's presence in the film, and he's the one observing uh, Jack, the Jack Torrance character acting like an ass uh, in the hotel, you know, allegedly writing. You know, that's the Colorado Lounge. He converts the Jack Torrance character, converts that into his office, his writing space, but he's not writing in there. That's like I've explained in prior videos. Jack Torrance slash Stephen King maybe didn't write anything. You know, all work and no play make Jack dull boy. N he's not working. He's not working. He's not writing. Nothing. And, st and Stanley's letting us know that Stephen King is a fraud. Okay, and the beige typewriter is Stanley Kubrick's presence. And the camera 
in general is is Stanley Kubrick's presence and um and so on and so forth. So I'll do another video about that possibly. But let me get into this article by Mr. Olivieri. I already read this first part, uh the first two paragraphs before this poster. Yeah. Um and then let me continue. I think I'm going to like this article. It seems like uh, it seems like Olivieri is going to be critical of Stephen King and his bullshit. So let's let's take a look. Um, so, continuing. The Shining opened on the 23rd of May, 1980, to mixed reviews. Variety best encapsulated the critics' feelings with everything to work with. Director Stanley Kubrick <clears throat> has teamed with jumpy Jack Nicholson to destroy all that was so terrifying about Stephen King's bestseller, which has been changed so much it's barely recognizable. Okay, ver uh, what was it? Variety. Yeah, and by the way, I'm going to interject my opinion and my observations and whatever as I read through this essay by Mr. Olivieri. Um, so, these these negative reviews of the movie, of this fabulous movie by this amazing film director, Stanley Kubrick. <sighs> I just wonder, like, what that was motivated by. I just wonder, like, how how does this business work? You know, the business of movie making. Who, why do why these reviewers like when they write a review? Is that really their their own opinion, or is that the opinion they're told to have by whoever? You know, I don't know. I don't know. Let me continue. Uh, perhaps Warner Brothers had hoped King could offer some backup to turn the reception around, but the writer's first public pronouncement about the film was certainly not what they expected. Uh, when asked about the reviews for Kubrick's adaptation, wrote the Los Angeles Times, King would only respond with a terse no comment, as if he had seen the movie, oh, sorry, asked if he had seen the movie, he replied yes, and what did he think of it? Another no comment. Again, what did Olivieri write up here about um, the note that Warner Brothers executives noted in an internal memo that King loved it? <laughs> Lies. Uh, and that Stephen King truly had a positive reaction, considered faith the film faithful to the book, and in any interview will say good things to promote the film. That was what maybe Warner Brothers wanted? king to do but he didn't follow through with that directive from the movie studio and he started out with these very terse no comment um re responses to questions and that's probably because after seeing the movie he realized in my theory my idea he realized that stanley kubrick tore him a new one and again he hasn't been able to walk straight since Okay. Um, so anyway, ha 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 ha, what did I just read? Uh, Techni- uh, uh, asked if he's any, uh, and did uh, no comment. Okay. Uh, so we continue. From that summer on, what King said was the opposite of the promised good things. Technically, the movie is flawless and the acting is great, he conceded, but it's not very scary. To tell the truth, he found it totally empty and totally flat. The Shining is Quote, a maddening, perverse, and disappointing film, end quote. In short, again, this is in quotes, a failure. Uh, I'd admired Kubrick for a long time and had great expectations for the project, but I was deeply disappointed in the end result. Of course you were, Stephen. You didn't expect him to expose you as a raging, crazy drug addict and basically a fraud as a writer. Hmm. That's my commentary. That's not Olivieri. Um, continuing, whenever he got the chance, he further elaborated his point of view. The movie was very cold. Horror works best when it's hot, when it's an emotional trip, like a roller coaster. Horror is also a medium where there has to be a feeling of love and warmth. Is he insane? What? Warm love and warmth in horror. Does this man know what he's... Again, do we blame it on him or do we blame it on the drugs? Allegedly, he's clean. 
you know, after 1986, his wife staged that intervention, allegedly. And he still, you know, even after Kubrick's death in 1999, he couldn't shut up. He couldn't shut his horrible mouth. And he couldn't stop spewing hatred and, and, and foulness regarding um, Stanley Kubrick. That just shows us what kind of person he is. Anyway, <clears throat> they're, they're also... There, ha oh, excuse me. There has to be a feeling of love and warmth in a horror in a horror movie. Really, you have to care when people die. Why, Stephen? Who says you? Uh. Yet in The Shining, there is no sense of emotional investment into family whatsoever. Did he even see the movie? That's my question. Did Stanley? I'm not Stanley. No, Stephen. Did he even see the movie? Let me keep going. Kubrick's direction is good, but it's heartless. Mm -hmm. uh, what's basically wrong with Kubrick's version of The Shining, King explained, is that it's a film by a man who thinks too much and feels too little. Ooh! Ooh, now I'm very happy that Stephen King was exposed by Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick did what he had to do to this little jerk. Steve, well, maybe not a little jerk, he's supposed to be very tall, but you know what I mean, right? Kubrick did what needed to be done, all right, in more ways than one in this movie. Ha 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 ha. Drawing from the classic misanthropic charge against the rigidly formal director, King said that Kubrick seemed to be in charge of an ant farm. He had turned his people into ants, saying, well, what happens if they do this? What happens if they do that? I didn't care for that. Who cares what you care for? Stephen? This, once again, I explained in my previous videos, this is, The Shining was Stephen King's third published novel, and second, not first, but second movie that was adapted in, uh, that was a uh, movie that was adapted from a novel. The first was Carrie in 1976. The second was The Shining, uh, that was released in May of 1980. And as basically a writer, a, a, a novelist, in the beginning of his career and his fame, instead of being grateful, he, he said things like this. That makes no sense to me. Absolutely none. So he's very angry, obviously, at The Shining, the movie, and at Stanley Kubrick, the director. Again, I think that anger is personal because he realized as he watched a movie, maybe because of interactions and conversations he had with Kubrick, he realized that all of these portrayals and representations of the Jack Torrance character were really portrayals and representations of him, Stephen King, and his fraudulent career, and his complete lack of talent, and intelligence, and, you know, all kinds of things with regard to writing, but also his, again, very flawed character as a human being. Okay? He just doesn't seem like a nice person to me. That's just my opinion. Let me continue reading this. Um, ha, 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 ha. It just becomes sort of an exercise. This is still King talking. It just becomes sort of an exercise. More and more open, um, King said that Kubrick was too pragmatic and rational. A total anal retentive. <laughs> I did say that Kubrick tore Stephen King a new one. Mm, so he's got like several assholes now. Um, you, sh <laughs> you should have seen the fan mail, he joked. They wanted to kill the guy. Which, which guy did they want to kill? Stephen. Are you, are, you, are you talking about Stanley Kubrick? Is that the guy that they wanted to kill? Or did they want to kill Jack Torrance? Or did they want to kill you? Did they? Did you realize that Jack Jack Torrance was basically, or you know, Jack Nicholson was basically portraying you? Is that why you're still sore all these years later, Stephen? Hmm. Anyway, moving on. Uh, King also objected to Kubrick's treatment. Oh dear. Uh, <laughs> King also objected to Kubrick's treatment of the novel's main character, Jack Torrance, who in the film seems crazy from the beginning. 
Uh, the character has no arc in that movie. Yes, he does, Stephen. Uh, absolutely no arc at all. When we first see him, he's crazy as a shithouse rat. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, all he does is get crazier. N again, this I believe that this is Stephen King's reaction to Stanley Kubrick's represent representation of him in the movie. That's why he's so mad. All he does is get crazier. In the book, he's a guy who's struggling with his sanity and finally loses it. Oh, when he beats one of his students half to death? When he treats his wife like garbage? And his child, too? He's struggling with his sanity? That's struggling with your sanity? Being abusive and violent? I, I would hate to see what, what, what he would be like what, if he wasn't struggling. Oh, my God. To me, that's a tragedy. <sighs> yeah. Uh, in the movie, there's no tragedy because there's no real change. Well, we've seen this person. We've seen Stephen King. You know, in, in the movie, uh, not movies, in the videos that I've done, all the trash he's talked about, Stanley Kubrick, and he has changed over the years. Never. He still keeps saying the horrible things he says over and over again. So I guess you don't have an arc, uh, Stephen. Anyway, let me keep it moving. I wanted to see an early scene where he takes the kid on his lap, gives him a kiss, and says, I love you, Danny. Instead, the movie begins with Nicholson regaling the family with a story about cannibals. Without an arc for its anti-hero, the film has no center and no art. Did he watch the movie? I'm asking again. Because, again, the first person to bring up cannibalism is Wendy. She's the one who mentions the Donner Party. And Jack is answering Danny's question about what's the Donner Party. So if you want to blame anybody, uh, Stephen, blame Wendy for bringing it up. Not Jack for responding. That's another issue for another time, but we've already covered that. I've already covered that in my videos. But, uh cannibalism. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Uh, King has a problem with the can. Oh, Lord. Well, you put it in the book, though, didn't you? Or did you? I don't know, because Stanley Kubrick didn't really pay much attention to uh, Stephen King's book. Rightfully so. It was horrible. Uh, anyway, keep it, let's keep it moving. King strongly disapproved of Kubrick's casting choices. Jack Nicholson was all wrong for the part. His last big role had been in One Flew of a Cuckoo's Nest, and between that and his manic grin, the audience automatically identified him as a loony from the first scene. No, they didn't. Stephen, that's you. You're worried that that's what people will think of you. Oof, moving on. I didn't like Nicholson in it, doing predictable Nicholson shtick. Oh, my God. No, I hated what Kubrick did with that. Uh, if I had a chance to do that over again, I'd cast anybody but Jack Nicholson, even Shirley MacLaine. What the hell? Oh, my God. As for Shelley Duvall, King stated, that's an example of absolutely grotesque casting. I mean, talk about an ins talk about insulting to women. <sighs> okay. I've, I've talked about this before, too. Uh, Shelley Duvall's Wendy is really one of the most misogynist characters ever put on film. I guess that means he's seen every movie ever that, that was ever made, right? In, on planet Earth. Ooh, the idiot. Uh, she's basically just there to scream and be stupid, and that's not the woman that I wrote about. No, you wrote about a woman who endured uh, years of her husband's abuse and and stayed with him and basically never fought back. That's the character you wrote. That's the character you wrote. The Wendy in the movie, even though I think she's batshit crazy, she fights back in a meaningful way. Your Wendy does not. As far as I know. I mean, I haven't read the book. Maybe I'm wrong. But, like, the Wendy in the book seems much more misogynistic than the Wendy character in the movie. That's just my opinion, but... Um, and Olivieri includes in this article a uh, clip 
from, I guess, the Times, the Los Angeles Times, uh, a king of horror, really. Uh, an interview with Stephen King in the Los Angeles Times. Doesn't say what date, but it doesn't really matter. Um, oof. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, author of incredibly creepy stuff thrills him in Pasadena. Oh, Lord. I'll read this. This is interesting. He put it here, so I'll... Olivieri put it here, so I'll read it. Um, author of... Okay, by Ed, Edmund Newton, Time Staff Writer. Okay, let me read this. It's not too big. Uh, what do you do with a man who takes a perverse pleasure in scaring the living daylights out of you? You celebrate him, of course. You give him standing ovations, respond to his jokes with wall-shaking laughter, and wave your fist in the air, shouting, Yeah! when he mentions the title of his books. Pet Cemetery, Yeah! The Shining, All Right! This is sort of like Stephen King's greatest hits, said horror story writer, said the horror story writer during a jocular, uh, confiding address to an audience of youthful King aficionados at the Pasadena Public Library last week. Uh, for many of the 250 people packed into the little auditorium, some of whom had stood in line in front of the library all night to buy the last tickets for the sold-out speech, this was the literary event. Uh, the author came to realize, he said, that anyone can have the impulses of the murderous father in The Shining. Really, Stephen? Anyone? Oh, this is ridiculous. Anyway, uh, this, there, there's a reason Olivieri put this here. It makes Stephen King look horrible, in my opinion. That's my interpretation of this. If I'm wrong, and if somehow Mr. Olivieri sees my video, please correct me, sir, if I'm wrong about anything I said regarding your ideas or your characterizations of anything. Um, you know, I'm very open to criticism. And if I got anything, you know, wrong about your interpretations, please do let me know. Uh, childhood fears. Okay, this is still the Times article. When you get up in the middle of the night to give the baby his bottle, King said, out of some sewer back there in one's mind, there's an alligator saying, kill it, use the pillow. The whispering says, Jack Torrance is you. The if this is how he behaved around Stanley Kubrick, then there's no doubt in my mind. I mean, maybe there was a little bit of doubt before I just read this sentence, but now there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. Yes, Stanley Kubrick is exposing the living shit out of Stephen King in his movie, The Shining. He doesn't like Stephen King. He thinks he's a wretched human being, and he wants the world to know. That's that's all I... that No, I, I there's absolutely no doubt in my mind now. Who talks like this who talks about <sighs> killing a child and saying that anybody can do that no not anybody can do that not everybody is a demon like you the whispering jack torrance is you yeah jack torrance is you stephen it's not anybody else it's you and stanley showed us okay stanley showed us exactly that Oh, my God. King's latest theme came to him, the author said, from his 12-year-old son, Owen, who provided unwitting father for the prolific King horror machine. The boy had wanted his father to check a book out of the library for him rather than putting it on his own card. Why? I'm afraid of the library police. Huh? Owen confessed to his father, saying that a family member had once told him that a corpse of enforcers punished derelict li Oh, my God. Okay, listen. You know, this, obviously, this is not the whole article. It's continued. But this one, I, th I think maybe Mr. Olivieri wanted us to see this sentence. This first sentence, the quote, under the childhood fears heading here. This is, this is, this is sickening. This is terrible. Mm-mm. No. Let me continue with the article, um, the essay. Uh, most, most significantly, so we ended up, he said, uh, 
Oh, yeah, that Wendy is misogynistic. Okay. Uh, more significantly, King has criticized Kubrick and his co-screenwriter, Diane Johnson, for their approach to the horror genre. It was like they had never seen a horror movie before, King said. In fact, Kubrick had watched several in preparation for The Shining, expressing particular praise for William Friedkin's The Exorcist, 1973, and Roman Polanski's Rosemary's Baby, 1968. Uh, huh, interesting. Uh, Johnson was giving a course at the University of California at Berkeley on the Gothic novel and uh, when she was chosen by Kubrick as a writing partner. Such a lit literate academic approach proved ineffective for King. I read an interview in which Johnson said that she and Stanley had read a lot of literature and that they had tried to figure out why people are always so in instinctively frightened of dolls or inanimate objects with faces and features all of that was very interesting but nothing in the movie is really scary again has he seen this movie uh, you don't necessarily have to be a right wiring expert to turn electric lights on and off this again this analogy makes absolutely no sense if this is if this is the best he can do with analogies I don't I do not trust him as a writer. Uh they had no real background in the field. Oh, unlike you. Unlike you. Okay, what what background did he have at that point in his career? He had published in 19 by 1977 he had in he had published 3 novels. The Shining was published in early 1977 and the movie started being filmed in 1978. I've gone over this before. So that was his third novel. All the rest of his work were short stories for, like, you know, skin mags. But Diane Johnson, who was teaching <laughs> at the University of California at Berkeley, on the Gothic novel, oh no, she has no experience. And Stanley Kubrick has no experience, no background. But you do, Stephen. At that point in your career, you had all the background necessary. Really? Mm, I'm, I'm thinking that once again, again, I've covered this in other videos. I believe, in my opinion, based on my observation and my interpretation of my observations, that Stephen King thought he was going to write the screenplay, and Stanley Kubrick said no. Not, absolutely fucking not. And again, that's another reason why Stephen King is sore, still sore, after all these years. Let me keep it moving. The best illustration of what's wrong with Kubrick's film, according to King, is the scene in which Wendy discovers Jack's manuscript, a scene King found had spine-chilling potential. Kubrick cuts from her face to the pages, from her face to the pages, from her face to the pages. You're getting more and more frightened by what's going on here, and you know what's going to happen. You don't want it to happen, but you know it's going to happen. It's what the horror movie is. It's something like... Ugh. It's, oh, he's, he's, he's not okay in the head. I'm sorry he's not. First the thing about smothering an infant, and now this. Uh, it's something like a girl jerking you off in a car, okay? You know that sooner or later there's going to, ugh, there's going to be an orgasm. The question is, when is it going to come, and how intense is it going to be? So back and forth, back and forth. The, uh, ew. That's gross. Why would he just talk like that? Ooh, no class at all. Um, but whatever, let's keep it moving. Then for some reason that I still don't understand, Kubrick cuts away and shows us Jack, shows us Nicholson approaching her. That you don't understand? You're a fool. That's why you don't understand. Let me keep it moving. You know that he's there. You don't need to see him. Really? You don't need to see him to know that he's there? I mean, how much coke did you do? And what should happen? Oh, good Lord. You know that he's there. You don't need to see him. Uh, and what should happen is that while she's looking at the book, there should just be this king grabs the interviewer's sh shoulder and him saying, you like it? But Kubrick cuts away and shows us Nicholson first. So there's no payoff. There's that. You think there's no payoff in that scene, Stephen? Are you? Oh, he's crazy. He's not okay. Uh, Anyway, I'll continue. The effect for King is that is that of a guy who doesn't know how to tell a joke. Oh no, you're wrong, Stephen. 
You're wrong. Stanley Kubrick knew how to tell a joke really well. And actually, he didn't even really need to tell it. All he had to do is represent you in his movie. You're the joke, Stephen King. That's what you are. Okay, moving on. Uh, King expressed interest in remaking The Shining to do justice to the story. Uh, the chance materialized in 1996 when the network ABC, following the success of a string of TV adaptations from King's novels, It, uh, Tommy Lee Wallace, 1990, The Tommy Knockers, John Power, 1993, The Stand, Mick Garris, 1994, and The Langoliers, Tom Holland, 1996, the last two scripted by King himself, agreed to finance a miniseries entitled Stephen King's the Shining. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear God. It was a lifelong dream coming true for King, who could finally correct. <laughs> oh, if you if you know this movie, you know why. Um, that's hilarious. It, U Ulivieri using the word correct. <laughs> Kubrick's version. <laughs> by writing a teleplay based on his old screenplay for The Shining, which Kubrick had ignored. I told you. I knew it. Oh, Lord. That, oh, this is juicy. This is tea. Thank you, Mr. Olivieri. I'm enjoying this very much. Um, he, could, he could correct Kubrick's version. Oh, my God. Did he do it with an axe? Did he correct Kubrick's version with an axe? <laughs> Oh, this is good. Oh, anyway, let's keep it moving. Uh, not once did Kubrick say anything about King's constant criticism of the film. It's, you know, because he was a gentleman. Okay. Uh, in the same fashion... Oh, so, uh, let, me, let me start that again. I didn't do that right. Not once did Kubrick say anything about King's constant criticism of the film and, in the same quiet fashion, took his revenge. Ooh, I told you this is going to be tea since he still held the rights to the novel. <gasps> I did not know that. Oh, I did not know that. One of his stipulations for giving them up was that King would be prevented from further commenting on his film. The other was a $1.5 million. Oh, excuse me. The other was $1.5 million. In a stunning move, Kubrick bought King's silence, but King... But had King pay for it? Oh, oh, oh my God. My God. Did you all know this? My, my regulars, my, my regular people who comment and look at my videos. Did you all know this? Let me read that again, because this is just very good. Thank you, Mr. Olivieri. Not once did Kubrick say anything about King's constant criticism of the film, and in the same quiet fashion took his revenge, since he still held the rights to the novel. One of his stipulations for giving them up was that King would be prevented from further commenting on his film. The other was $1.5 million. In a stunning move, Kubrick bought King's silence, but had King pay for it. I know I've got a couple of lawyers who are my regular viewers. You all know, you know, you all know who I'm talking to. If, if, if it's you, you know I'm talking to you. Y'all let me know in the comments what you think about that move. Because that was a smooth move by Kubrick. It seems like that to me, but I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how these things work or, or anything uh, uh, of that nature. So y'all let me know. This is, this is good. This is good. Anyway, <laughs> the card of Stephen King's The Shining. Hideous. Let's keep it moving. Uh, the majority of reviews for Stephen King's The Shining were good at the time. Yet, I think the most truthful ap appraisal for the miniseries came from the Boston Globe. Despite three episodes and 273 minutes. Oh dear of running time it is a small picture now this is according to the boston globe it is a small picture not small in its commercial prospects but small in its artistic ambitions some viewers might just head to the video store to see how kubrick did so much more with the same material in less than half the time like a great novel kubrick's the shining grows richer with each viewing in king's version 
Once was more than enough. Ooh, thank you, Boston Globe. Oh, my goodness. Uh, King honored the deal with Kubrick until the director died. <gasps> Uh-oh. Okay, King honored the deal with Kubrick until the director died after a few additional months of respectful silence. From December 1999 on, he resumed criticizing Kubrick's film just as he had before. Oh, this is good. This is more, this is very interesting information. Um, and remember in one of these damn videos that I did, it's in here somewhere. You got to look for it. And I don't remember which one because I did so many of them. But I said, wasn't in my opinion. I'll just go ahead and say it. So there's no doubt in your mind as to what I think or how I feel. Um, in my opinion, this is not Olivieri. This is me, Miss M. Um, in my opinion, that car accident, very suspicious. Because the car accident happened almost exactly three months after Kubrick's death in 1999. And I talked about it in one of my videos. I kind of, I said it without saying it, that to me, the alleged events of that accident, as as reported by the press, to me, they don't make sense. To me, Miss M, they don't make sense. Not even a little bit. And I believe, I've discussed this with, with, you know, people, um, this is not their opinion. This is mine. I think the accident, how it happened, when it happened, what happened, I don't know. I can't trust Stephen King. He, he's not serious. He's not a person that you can trust in my opinion. Um, I think he took advantage of that event, whether it happened the way he says it happened or not. I don't know. But I think he took advantage of that event to get his name in the newspapers again and try to uh, overshadow uh, Stanley Kubrick's passing that year. I think he's despicable and detestable in every conceivable way. That's my opinion. Okay, make of that what you will. But that's just how I feel. Okay. So, uh, from December 1999, he, he resumed criticizing Kubrick's film just as he had before. Ooh, what a piece of shit. Ooh, uh, King has never been so vocal about any other adaptation he didn't like. True, The Shining is a Kubrick film and it has received far more attention than any King adaptations by less revered directors. Yet, the consistency in King's condemnation, almost an obsession, Mr. Olivieri, you're being very generous. No, it's not almost an obsession. He's He has problems. Okay. Anyway, almost an obsession. Must be attributed to something deeper than a mere dissatisfaction with an unfaithful adaptation. After all, in 1979, when asked about the changes that Kubrick was rumored to be making to the novel, King said bluntly, This bullshit about authors having their books changed. A story changes, and it should. It's right that it should. Oh my God, this, this man is just not consistent. Stephen King is not consistent. He can't be trusted. I told you. Um, and like I said, I, I, I've said this before in other videos, before I read this article, long before, I believe that S uh, Stephen King's hatred of The Shining and of Stephen, uh, of Stanley Kubrick is personal because he realizes what Stanley Kubrick did to him with that film in more ways than one. Okay, let me continue. We could find an obvious explanation for such a rejection by likening King's experience to that of an Anthony Burgess, the author of A Clockwork Orange, who became so annoyed by questions about violence and copycat killers and so irritated by how much Kubrick's film had overshadowed his novel that he started to criticize Kubrick's approach and even to detest his own book. Wow. I didn't know that. But King enjoyed such a popular success with each new novel that it would have been easy for him to let the book versus film dispute go. Uh, 
When Kubrick's film was released, King was already more than just famous. He was a brand name. His first two books, Carrie and Salem's Lot, sold 35,000 copies in their hardcover editions and 4.5 million copies as paperbacks. The Shining was King's first hardcover bestseller, reaching 50,000 copies sold. Yet perhaps, and this was true for Burgess too, King kept talking about The Shining because he enjoyed the additional fame brought by being associated with one of the greatest film directors. When the film was being made with an excess of secrecy, with no outsider allowed on the set, nor any interviews permitted, King happily revealed to the press that he allegedly saw during the visit to the set or heard chatting with Kubrick's crew, such as a larger-than-life replica of Nicholson's head that splits open and worms crawl out of it. Oh, Oh, they were putting out disinformation. Kubrick was, it looks like to me anyway. And a game room that's full of electronic games that all come to life when Danny comes in. Ooh, Lord. Yeah, like Kubrick was on to him. And and maybe the people who were saying that knew that King was listening. And they were maybe trying to feed him false information because he knew that he was a big mouth. That's just my interpretation. Anyway, moving, uh, keep it moving. King also revealed that John Williams was composing the score for Kubrick, saluting the choice as very commercial. Kubrick really is trying to make a blockbuster. Though these rumors are still repeated today, even if the magazine Take One had exposed them as unfounded right away. King's involvement with this project is such nil that most of his information has come second-hand from Peter S. Peracos and Jim, Al Jim Albertson of Cine Fantastique. Interesting. Uh, it could be that King tried to aggrandize his role in the production to compensate for the fact that Kubrick didn't want him to be part of his creative process. Ooh, that's more tea. It, it is true that King never showed much consideration for the movie business. Uh, the movies have never been a big deal to me. Oh, that's why you keep dealing with them your whole life? Oh, the movies have never been a big deal to me, he once he said once. If they're good, that's terrific. If they're not, they're not. But I see them as a lesser medium than fiction, than literature. This man is an idiot. Uh, they're not high art the way I think books are high art, he re reiterated. Uh-huh. Mm, that sounds like sour grapes to me. Uh, at the same time, though, King has shown he quite likes to be involved in film production. He wrote and acted in George Romero's Creep Show, 1982, had a number of cameos and subsequent adaptations of his works, and even accepted Dino De Laurentiis's proposal to write and direct a film, Maximum Overdrive, 1986. Furthermore, King wrote, produced, or executive produced many films and television series, mostly adapted from his own works, and with more with the more or less explicit intention of exerting some degree of control on their stories and characters. A moderate disappointment with not being consulted by Kubrick, someone King admired until the late seventies anyway, may have been present. A moderate? Again, you're being very generous, Mr. Olivieri. The fact that Kubrick selected someone else for the adaptation of The Shining probably caused even greater fi friction, especially given Diane jo Johnson's background. King has always been vigorously averse to the limited views of the intelligentsia, who he is not a part of and never will be. That's me talking, not Olivieri. Um, views of the intelligentsia who, in his opinion, do not take genre fiction seriously and have a propensity to ghettoize horror and fantasy and instantly relegate them beyond the pale of so-called serious literature. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, King tried hard to have his books taken seriously. For example, The Shining is filled with direct and indirect allusions to revered masterpieces of past genre fiction, such as Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House and Edgar Allan Poe's The Mask of the Red Death, and in its early conception was even divided into five acts as if it were a Shakespearean tragedy. Oh, that's pathetic. Uh, ugh. 
Okay. If King never really cared about movies, he definitely cared very much about books and literature and felt he was being treated unfairly. That little elite, which is clustered in the literary magazines and book review sections of influential newspapers and magazines on both coasts, assumes that all popular literature must also, by definition, be bad literature. How would you know, Stephen? Have you spoken to any of them? If they don't want you around, how do you know how they feel? That's just me. That's my opinion. Uh, those criticisms are not really against bad writing. They're against an entire type of writing. My type of writing, as it turns out. No, they're against your writing because it is terrible. It is, it is, it is terrible in, there are not enough words to describe how terrible your writing is. Now I'm addressing Stephen. You know that. Um, Kubrick, who needed to understand and expand <clears throat> on the horror genre, didn't pick King. Oh, I knew it. I said that in one of my videos. It looks like, oh, I said in one of my videos, it, it, it looks like somebody forced, uh, Stanley Kubrick to make this book into a movie. But thank you, Olivieri, again. King, who needed to understand, uh, <laughs> didn't pick King, a hands on expert in the field, but summon Johnson, uh, oh no. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. They're talking about the screenplay. Uh, Oliveri's talking about the sc screenplay. Kubrick, who needed to understand and expand on the horror genre, didn't pick King, a hands-on expert in the field, allegedly. Uh, but Summer, uh, that was my interjection, but Summon Johnson, a revered novelist and university professor who sometimes wrote reviews for the New York Times Book Review, someone who fit the bill of those avatars of high culture, as King once called them. And what, and what did Johnson say about King and his novels as soon as she had finished her work on The Shining? Stephen King isn't Kafka. Ah, yeah, yeah. I thought his, I thought his were the kind of books that one gets in an airport. Oh, wow. In King's resentment, there may well have been a re reaction to a crime of les majestes. Oh, my goodness. Some of these, some of the stories that King recounted over the years seem to support the idea that he wished to get more credit. The most repeated one is King's fictionalized account. Oh, Tankard, I hope you're listening. The most repeated one is King's fictionalized account of how Kubrick found his novel. The secretary in Kubrick's office got used to his this steady thump, thump, thump from the inner office, which was Kubrick picking up books, reading about 40 pages, and then throwing them against the wall. He was really looking for a property. One day along about 10 o'clock, the thump stopped coming, and she buzzed him. He didn't answer the buzz. She got really worried, thinking he'd had a heart attack or something. What the hell? <sighs> Anyway, she went in, and he was reading The Shining. He was about halfway through it. He looked up and said, This is the book. Shortly after that, Warners in California wanted to know if the book had been bought. The story is totally inaccurate. Not only did Kubrick never have an inner office with a secretary, he read all the books at home, but he also received the manuscript in galley proofs via air mail sent by John Calley of Warner Brothers. Okay, I covered that in one of my videos, too. Who put this out? Who put this story out? Did Stephen King do this? Or, you know, one of his people? King, yeah, oh, no, yeah, no, it says right here, sorry. King's fictionalized account. So he just flat out lied. Stephen King just flat out lied about this whole story about about Stanley Kubrick acting like a maniac throwing books up against the wall in his office. Oh, no. And I, again, I covered this in, in, my, uh, in other articles that I read in um, my videos. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick wasn't looking for The Shining. The Shining was, seems like it was more or less foisted upon him. ay ay ay. Ay, 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 ay. Let me keep it moving. At book readings, King never missed the opportunity to narrate his single, dis his single discussion with Kubrick. 
Like the good novelist he is, King tells the anecdote like a horror story, for the great amusement of his audience. One day, very early in the morning, let's say 7 a.m., he was shaving in the bathroom. His wife came running and startled him, causing him to cut himself with the razor blade. In another version, she had such a terrified look on her face that King thought something horrible had happened to one of their kids. Mm. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's on the phone, his wife said instead, and King, either with half-face still covered in shaving cream or blood streaming down his neck, went and picked up the handset, through which a gravelly voice said, Hi, Stanley Kubrick here. Don't you agree that all stories of ghosts are fundamentally optimistic? Dumbfounded, half asleep or hungover, depending on the version, King faltered, What do you mean? And King, I'm sorry, and Kub Kubrick explained, Well, if there are ghosts, it means we survive death. And that's fundamentally an optimistic view, isn't it? <sighs> what the hell? Oh, oh, sorry, what? No, not what the hell. Uh, what about hell? King asked quick-wittedly. Usually the story features a long silence on the line at this moment, as if the wheels inside Kubrick's head were slowly turning. Well, I don't believe in hell, Kubrick finally replied, and hung up. That sounds like another lie, just like the books against the wall thing. I'm just saying. Um, in an unpublished bit from an interview with British film critic Alexander Walker, Kubrick acknowledged he had heard the story and revealed it was... Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Kubrick acknowledged he had heard the story and revealed it was a total, total figment of King's imagination. Maybe that's why he writes such clever plots. Ooh, I love this. I love this tea. This is good tea. Um, the two talked over the telephone on one occasion, and it is possible that Kubrick said The Shining was an optimistic story, given that he gave exactly the same witty remark to Jack Nicholson. But the phone conversation was mostly about Kubrick asking King's opinion on a different ending for the film, with Halloran becoming possessed and finishing the job that Jack started, killing Wendy and Danny. Uh, the Torrances are then seen as ghosts at the Overlook Hotel uh, the following spring. In interviews closer to the event, King didn't sensationalize the facts and told the story straight. Take, for example, this interview from 1978. The impression I got from our conversation is that Kubrick does not believe in life after death, yet he thought that any vein of the supernatural story, whether it is horrifying or whether it is pleasant, is inherently optimistic because it points towards the possible survival of the spirit. And I told him, that's all very good as a philosophy, but when an audience is brought face to face with the slaughter of characters that they care about, uh, then they will cry for your head once they get out of the theater. Mm. Oh, and this is, this is the, uh, this, this here on this, I don't know what this is. Is it a poster or uh, a dust jacket for the book? I think it is. Uh, and they've got this, this uh, here, uh, again, Stephen King talking about Stanley Kubrick and that conversation. When I first talked to Kubrick some months ago, he wanted to change the ending. He asked me for my opinions on Halloran becoming possessed and ha 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 ha. Then the scene, ha 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 ha. However, the audience would see Jack, Wendy, and Danny in the idyllic family scene as ghosts, sitting together laughing and talking. Hmm. Mm-mm. Okay. Mo moving on. How much more of it? Mm. I, I mean, I'm enjoying reading this, but <laughs> there's a lot. Um, let's see. Okay, let me, let me, I'm going to read this all the way to the end. This is amazing. Uh, surely the clash between King and Kubrick has something to do with their respective cinematic tastes. To his own admission, King's brand of horror is Brand X, a low-priced brand. Mm -hmm. He loved Reanimator, Stuart Gordon, 1985, and Return of the Living Dead, Dan O'Bannon, 1985. Uh, that's my kind of movie, you know, low. He, ugh, yeah, I can see why. Uh, he is 
of course, able to appreciate more stylish and visionary films like Brian De Palma's Carrie, 1976, yet he is quite the traditionalist as far as horror films are concerned. In his non-fiction book about the subject, Dance Macabre, uh, King, in fact, extended his ideas to the horror genre itself. The horror story beneath its fangs and fright wig is really conservative. Its main purpose is to reaffirm the virtues of the norm by showing us what awful things happen to people who venture into taboo lands. Modern horror stories are not much different from the morality plays of the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, we have the comforting knowledge when the lights go down in the theater or when we open the book that the evildoers will almost certainly be punished and measure will be returned for measure. Kubrick's films, on the contrary, willfully explore ta uh, taboo lands and never offer comforting endings. His career is a testament to cinematic unconventionality and often sheer iconoclasm. Isn't that why we love him? Isn't that why we love him? Or one of the many reasons. Um, okay. This is, this is really interesting. This is really interesting. This whole article is so very interesting, I've got to say, uh, and I just want to read the whole thing and take you along with me for the journey. Uh, anyway, after years of repeated complaints, King seems to have understood the question more clearly in recent times. He acknowledged the real difference between him and Kubrick lies in their respective takes on the nature of evil. In the novel, Jack Torrance is, difficult, is a difficult character, but it's fundamentally a sympathetic character, King said in 2011. And I always visualized him as a piece of metal which has been bent one way and the other by these malignant spirits. Stanley Kubrick saw the haunting coming from Jack Torrance, whereas I always saw it from the outside. All the characters were being threatened by forces from without, from ghosts, from real supernatural creatures. So we had a fundamental difference of opinion about it. Yeah, I bet you did. Oh, Lord. The difference runs even deeper. For King, when evil comes from within, it is always an act of free and conscious will, a conscious decision. <sighs> oh, Lord. My, my definition of evil, he said while discussing the novel, is conscious will to do harm. Jack's background of dysfunctional upbringing, alcoholism, and frustrations predisposes him to be seduced by the Overlook Hotel, but he is not doomed to succumb. Then why did you make him succumb? That's me. That's me asking a question. Ugh, okay. There are a number of occasions in the novel in which he could prevent a tragic ending. He could let Wendy take Danny to a doctor in the city. He could drive the snow cat and escape from the hotel with his family. He could use the radio and call for help. Jack consciously decides to follow an evil path. Nothing is predetermined in King's world. When Halloran explains The Shining and its visions to Danny, he says those things don't always come true. So... Basically, his Stephen King's book is a, is a total mess. A mess. This is com this is mess. Uh, uh, mm -mm. No, his definition of evil. <sighs> oh, Lord, I have I I I. If if I comment on that, it will take too much time. His definition of evil. Lord, I don't care about Stephen King's definition of evil. Anyway, uh, Kubrick's take seems quite different. There's something inherently wrong with the human personality, he once said. There's an evil side to it. Yup, I agree with that. Evil, according to Kubrick, resides in human nature itself. He described The Shining as a sort of Jekyll and Hyde story, but without the Jekyll. Ooh. Showing there is no room for a good side in his philosophy. Uh, I don't know if I agree with that, because I don't I don't think of The Shining as an exploration of human psychology. I believe that, in my opinion, I believe that The Shining and what Kubrick was doing is an exploration of, again, uh, 
the stories that human beings have been told over and over and over again, more or less since the beginning of history uh, with regard to mythology and religion. Those stories include characters such as gods and goddesses or whatever deities that behave a certain way because they feel that they have license to do so because they're gods and goddesses and various deities. And these stories have either, maybe not no basis in reality, but they're used as allegories for something. And allegories usually having to do with why it's okay to have a ruling class that controls you and tells you what to do and takes money from you in the form of taxes and sends you off to fight wars and die and whatever. I think that Kubrick is very heavily criticizing mythology and the fact that it's, it, I, I believe that he might be criticizing mythology and the fact that maybe mythology is in its own way inherently evil. That's, that's what I think that Stanley Kubrick might be doing. That's just my opinion. Okay. Um, I, I don't believe that he's showing there's no room for a good side in his philosophy because he's not showing us real people. He's showing us characters and he's showing us characters again, basically in the same way that mythology shows us characters. I mean, again, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but I think that Kubrick might be doing like a postmodern kind of treatment of mythology and or religion and all the stories that come along with it. He's, he's using, he's fighting fire with fire. I believe he's identifying, you know, identifying mythology as a negative thing. And he's trying to f maybe even fix the damage that all of these various mythologies and religious stories have done to humankind by showing us that why it's showing us that mythology is bullshit and why it's bullshit. That's my feeling. Um, so there, you know, that's how I feel. Uh, Kubrick's Jack Torrance couldn't have done anything differently. Uh, again, if I'm right about Jack Torrance is really Stephen King, I, I don't know if I, I agree with this, because, again, he's not representing an ordinary person. He's representing his own criticism of a person that he's met and maybe just doesn't like. It, in other words, Stephen King. That That's what I think. A quote from an interview with the French film critic Michael Cement is illuminating. Jack comes to the hotel psychologically prepared to do its murderous bidding, Kubrick said. He doesn't have very much further to go for his anger and frustration to become completely uncontrollable. He is bitter about his failure as a writer. Oh my, see what I, see what I mean, y'all? Um, he is bitter about his failure as a writer. He is married to a woman for whom he has only contempt. He hates his son in the hotel at the mercy of its powerful evil. He is quickly ready to fulfill his dark role. Again, where does that evil come from in the hotel? Does he say here? He, uh, the, the hotel's evil. What form does that hotel's evil take? I mean, some people, and I think maybe Mr. Olivieri too, they think it's ghosts. I don't think it's ghosts. I think the evil comes, in, again, from mythology and from um, the iconography of mythology throughout time, throughout history, the symbolism. And again, I think Kubrick is telling us that mythology is bullshit He's sh and showing us why it's bullshit and why the symbolism is bullshit and all of the stuff throughout history that have contributed to the oppression and subjugation of humankind. I think that's what he's doing. That's just my opinion. Uh, actions, I'm continuing with the article, actions are a role to fulfill, not an act of will. Borrowing a phrase from Kubrick's subsequent film, Full Metal Jacket, Jack Torrance was born to kill. No, he wasn't. Again, I don't agree with this. Respectfully, I don't agree with this. Um, no. You know, maybe, again, the character, Jack Torrance, based on the real-life person who, who eventually admitted that the book was about him, Stephen King. Same thing with Gustav Hasford, 
with regard to Full Metal Jacket. There's there's another like whack job um author. You know, I've done a video about that too. Um Actions are a role to fulfill. Again, this is talking about these characters in these movies. I don't think this is a commentary on real people. Real people are manipulated by, again, stories. Whether they're, they take the form of movies or literature or mythology or religion, people are manipulated and told that they must do bad things because that's what the gods want them to do. That has been our history as a human race. And again, I think Stanley Kubrick is challenging that very, very strongly with all of his films, not just The Shining. But that's, again, that's just me. Um, a look at how the three incarnations of The Shining end will clarify the point further. In the novel, Danny unmasks a raising, uh, a raising, no. In the novel, Danny unmasks a raging Jack as a false face a uh, simulacrum of his father, now completely driven by the Overlook Hotel. King uses the pronoun it instead of he for the character in the chapter. Uh, Jack briefly b regains consciousness, stops waving the mallet against Danny, and tells him to run away quick and remember, remember how much I love you. Ugh. Uh, moments later, Halloran resists the evil forces and takes Wendy and Danny under his arms, leading them away from the hotel, uh, from from leading them away while the hotel burns down. In the epilogue, the three survivors reconstitute a surrogate family. Okay, well, you know, the book is not the movie, and the movie is not the book. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, in the miniseries, in a ten years later coda, Jack reappears as a ghost at Danny's graduation, says, I love you, and blows a kiss to Danny, who comments, that's what I've been missing, a line that works quite well in his observation on King's part with regard to Kubrick's film. Oh, Lord. Okay. If the point wasn't clear enough, Halloran reassures Wendy that all's well that ends well. Mm-hmm. So, wait a minute now. We go from this to Dr. Sleep. Uh, I'm just saying. Okay. In the film, Halloran arrives at the hotel only to be killed by Jack. Danny and Wendy flee on Halloran's snowcat and slowly disappear in the mist. Jack freezes to death, but a photograph from 1921 in the hotel lobby suggests he has been a ghost reincarnated all along, maybe. I'm going to do a video about that photo. Uh, we need to talk about that photo. Something is up with that photo. As far as I know, it's not in the book. Hmm? It's not in the book. So, yeah, we need to talk about that. But that's for another time. Uh, King and Kubrick's works end in a, in a way that conforms to their respective views. The novel's conclusion restores order, and King's miniseries even more so. On the contrary, the film's conclusion, the most radical of Kubrick's open endings unleashes chaos. In any case, as wide it is, as it is, the difference in overall views doesn't really explain King's obsessiveness. Kubrick's film must have hit a rawer nerve. The fact is, The Shining is not any novel for King, and Jack Torrance is not any character. The sh oh, here we go. Okay, uh, The Shining came from my own really aggressive impulses towards my ki kids. King has revealed with surprising candor, going as far as mentioning a specific episode, I came home one day and Joe, my oldest boy, who was then three or four, had done all these cartoon and crayon drawings on this manuscript that I had been working on, and I was thinking of myself, uh, little son of a bitch, I could kill him. I could kill him. Look at this stuff. It's a very sorry thing to discover as a father that it is possible for bursts of time to literally literally hate your kids and feel that you could kill them. Again, this is not okay. I'm sorry, this is not okay. And if he's trying to, like, humanize the Jack Torrance character by saying shit like this, uh, no. No, this is not okay. Not okay.
Um, the shining originated from the memories, scars, as King called them, of how life was before selling his first novel, Carrie. Oh, because you hated being poor and you took it out on your family? I see. Okay, anyway, uh, my wife and I had been just about as poor as church mice for most of that time. We had two kids. I was drinking too much, and things were sometimes tense at home. In those years, King felt miserably unhappy, unable to provide adequately for my family, and terrified that he could never become a writer. <sighs> In my opinion, I feel like he never, he didn't, you know, he, he never, he, he really didn't ever become a writer. That's just my opinion. I feel like a man caught in a malign funhouse, blundering his way around with increasing desperation, looking for the way out. Fatherhood had also come as a sudden shock to him. I found myself sometimes pregnant with sordid, unromantic emotions I had never suspected, some directed towards my wife, some towards my children, then ra ranged from impatient they ranged from impatience to anger to outright hate. Oh, he sounds like a real picnic. He really does. He re he sa oh, no, 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 no. And again, this is not normal. This kind of behavior that he's describing of himself, the way he behaved, and the way he... No, this is not normal. To wish death on people. No. No, 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 no. Especially your family your spouse and your children. No. Um, he used to walk around his cheesy living room, a kid in my arms and over or over my shoulder, wondering exactly how I had wandered into this subprimary insane asylum. I never stopped loving my wife or my children, but there were times, oh boy, there were times, when I wondered what had happened and how. So basically he hated his life. And it seems like there's a good chance he was taking it out on his family. I'm just saying. That's my opinion. That's my assessment of this. Uh, these unique disclosures are featured in a rare essay by King, published in 1982 in a relatively obscure magazine, Whispers, and never reprinted elsewhere. Ooh. 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 This is good. In this extraordinarily frank look into his mind, King uncovered what lies beneath the book's tragic hero. By making Jack Torrance a drinker who was trying to quit, and by making him a part of the insidious child-beating syndrome that is passed from father to son to grandson, I found myself able to look around a dark corner and to see myself as I could have, as I could have been, oh, under the right set of circumstances. <clears throat> I think you all can maybe guess how I feel about that. Anyway, in some ways, I think Jack Torrance was an autobiographical, was as autobiographical as I'd ever come to a character. King summed up, in Jack Torrance, I saw a face that hypnotized me because it was, to a large extent, my own. I think that, again, Stanley Kubrick saw this before Stephen King did. Mm. Okay. Written in such a state of mind, the book became a ritual burning of hate and pain, a way for King to finally exercise and channel feelings that flowed almost whole from my subconscious. When The Shining was finished, he was finally able to put his dark past to rest. Really? Because allegedly he did coke all the way to 1986 so badly that he had to plug up his nose with cotton balls so that his typewriter wouldn't become all bloody from the coke nosebleeds. Check out my other videos. It's in there. Um, whatever. What? Oh, I don't trust him. I don't trust this man. Stephen King. I don't trust Stephen King. He seems like a terrible liar to me. Um, then arrived Kubrick and Johnson. By tampering with King's novel, they possibly affected King's inner life, too. When he watched what they had done with Jack, perhaps King saw an image of himself <gasps> that he wished he had forgotten. When he complained that Jack has no arc in the film, perhaps he was protesting about the happy ending that Kubrick had denied to him. Ooh. 
Ooh, this is good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, before dismissing this as far-fetched psychoanal psychoanalysis of Stephen King, let's consider the fact that he wrote a sequel to The Shining in 2003, Doctor Sleep, which deliberately ignores King's fi uh, Kubrick's film and follows an adult Danny battling with alcoholism like his father had. Dr. Sleep was adapted as a film in 2019 by Mike Flanagan, who merged both King's novels and Kubrick's film into a hybrid cinematic sequel. See McKenty in this special issue. Uh, Flanagan revealed that King didn't want to hear anything about a film version of Dr. Sleep initially, but relented when the director pitched him a specific scene towards the end of his proposed film. I wouldn't be surprised if the scene in question is the confrontation between Dan and the ghost of Jack Torrance at the Overlook Hotel bar. Here, the alcoholic's dilemma, which permeated the original novel, and that King knew all too well, comes back with a vengeance. A man tries, says the ghost of Jack to his adult son. He provides, but he's surrounded by mouths that eat and scream and cry and nag. So he asks for one thing, to take the sting out of those days, of the mouths eating, everything he makes, everything he has. And that family, a wife, a kid, those mouths eat time. They eat your days on earth. It's enough to make a man sick. And this is the medicine, he concludes, pushing a glass of whiskey forward to Dan, who resists, refuses to drink, and throws the glass away. Again, I'm disgusted by this. This is Stephen King's opinion of fatherhood, of being a husband and a father. He, in short, he hated it. He hated every second of it. And he wanted to be famous, and he wanted to be free of his family. Looks like that to me, anyway. He wanted to be free of his family because he thought he was better than his family. For whatever reason, I don't know. But this is, this is terrible. This is how he sees his family. As parasites leeching off of him. Oof. This is, this is really bad. Anyway, the medicine, Lord. Anyway, uh, Flanagan, who had been widely praised by King for his faithful adaptation of Gerald's game, made also sure that the denouement of Dr. Sleep, the film, mirrored that of The Shining, the novel. In the Overlook Hotel, Abra, the new young character who shines, confronts a possessed Dan and says, "'You're a mask, a false face.' Words which are, again, enough to make Dan come back to himself and urge Abra to run away. Uh, King opened the novel Dr. Sleep with quotes from the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and closed it with an old AA saying, uh, Fear stands for face everything and recover. Hopefully King has now faced everything Kubrick put him through and thanks to Flanagan recovered. Oh, dear. Uh, again, my opinion about this in particular definitely differs from the authors of this article. Um, <sighs> these Dr. Sleep people and Stephen King and whatever, you know, if Stephen King hated uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie so much, then why did they seem to do everything in their power to make sure that Dr. Sleep looked very similar to Stanley Kubrick's movie. You know, if King hated it so much, why are they? Why are, why are they? Why, why couldn't they do their own thing? Why did they have to steal so much from Stanley Kubrick? Why couldn't they just rely on Stephen King's work and do, you know, do that? Why couldn't they be more original? I don't know. I'm just saying. Um, Again, you know, I, I really like this article. It approaches and explores a lot of things that many other articles, or maybe no other article, explores regarding the Stephen King and Stanley Kubrick situation. Do I agree with everything in this article? No, and I've expressed when and how and why I don't agree with everything, at least most of it. Um, you know, again, if Mr... Uh, 
I'm sorry, uh, Ulivieri uh, sees this video and you think, I, I, I hope I haven't uh, misinterpreted anything that you put here. I, I tried to make it clear when I was reading your essay and when I was, you know, uh, commenting on what you wrote, I tried to make sure that I, uh, that I clearly, uh, th that I made the distinction between the two clear. Um, and again, uh, I love this article and I, I really like your work, Mr. Olivieri. Uh, and this article needed to be written, King versus Kubrick, The Origins of Evil. I'm sad that I didn't see it before or t pay more attention to it before, but, you know, here I am now. And, you know, that's that. I, I have questions. I have my own ideas. I have things that I want to know more about or just think more about to maybe come to some kind of conclusion or some kind of understanding in my own mind regarding a lot of things. A lot of things. Again, I've expressed what I think that Stanley Kubrick was trying to do. I know that I might very well be at least some somewhat wrong about my assessment, but, you know, uh, that, you know, it, my stuff, yeah, is observation-based and opinion-based and, and what have you. So, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed, um, what I had to say, uh, about this. Uh, I, I think this is a nice new development. And again, I'll be doing videos in the future, hopefully not in, not, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, relatively soon, uh, talking about, again, the presence of Stanley Kubrick and how he makes his own presence known in this movie, The Shining. So we shall see. We shall see. Um, once again, you all don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. And if you, you know, if you agree with what I said, let me know. If you don't agree with what I said, let me know. That's what the comments section is for. Again, I've been in dry dock for a little while, but I'm back. Hopefully I'll be back for a good long while. So until next time, you all, until the next time when I find yet another reason to talk at you in one of my very, very long videos, I'll go ahead and bid you bye-bye. So, bye-bye, everybody.